So in this next chapter, we're going to look at solutions. And as you can see right there, that's exactly what's being made in the picture and what we're going to learn about. So first, <clears throat> let's talk about and describe solutions. Solutions are homogeneous mixtures of two or more substances. So a minimum of two different things. My favorite example of a solution, salt water. Salt water consists of the salt and the water. The solution is also consist, consists of a solute. So a solute is the substance present in the lesser amount. And as you can see from the definition, they're spread evenly throughout the solution. They cannot be separated by simple filtration, uh, but they can, they can be separated by evaporation. They're not visible, but can give a color to the solution. So what this is all talking about, as far as filtration, think about separating spaghetti noodles from the water that you might boil them in. That's filtration, okay? A solution cannot be separated by that means. In terms of evaporation, if you actually took a salt water solution, put it on a pot on your stove and tried to boil it, or and did boil it, excuse me, you could boil all the water off and separate the salt back away from the solvent. And then in terms of the visibility, some solutions have a color to them when the solute dissolves in the solvent, some do not. Salt water does not have a color, it's colorless. But this substance here, and in fact this solution, copper, the copper sulf, whoops, copper sulfate solution, <clears throat> made by taking a solid sample of copper sulfate and dissolving it into water, making an aqueous solution, this does have a color to it. So just because something has a color or doesn't, that's not indicative of whether or not you've got a solution. Some can be colored, some are colorless. Okay, in terms of solutions, I also like to use the word mixture. Solution is also an example, or a type of mixture. And these mixtures or solutions can be of any of the physical states. Even the air that you're breathing right now is a, is a solution, technically, or a mixture of things. You're always going to have a solvent and a solute. And you may have more than one solute, just depends on how many things present in the lesser amount that you have. So solvent is present always as the primary component. So for instance, in the air that you're breathing right now, it's about 78% nitrogen. Oxygen is about 21%. And then there are, of course, that does not add, add up to 100%. That adds up to about 99%. So there's about 1% of other things in the air that you're breathing. Those other things, like water, depending on how humid or dry the air is right now around you, those other things would also be considered solutes. This uses the word primary because obviously, primarily, the substance that's present in the next largest amount is the oxygen. And then what you can see here, other solutions that are in the various physical states. So the air was a mixture of gases. If you have a can of pop, as we call it here in Chicago, but soda, probably everywhere else in the country, um, soda is gas mixed with a liquid. Solutions can be liquid, liquid, solid, liquid, gas, liquid, gas, gas, solid, solid, liquid, liquid, liquid. You kind of get where I'm going. So the physical state alone of either the solvent or the solute does not determine what's the, what is a solution. They can be any physical state. And if you look here, look at this table, you see lots of very common things that you probably have heard of before. <clears throat> In the solution, the solute is uniformly distributed through the solvent. So for instance, let's say you had a beaker with so sodium chloride solution. Okay, If you took a sample from the top, and if you took a sample from the bottom, you would have the same concentration of solute, sodium chloride, at the top as you would the bottom. That's what the uniformly distributed means. Water is the most common solvent. In fact, most people consider it the universal solvent. It's a polar molecule. It forms hydrogen bonds between the hydrogen atom and one molecule, like this guy here, this hydrogen, 
and the oxygen of another molecule, like this guy here. So hydrogen bonding is an intermolecular force. Remember, it occurs when you have one of these three bonds, and it's attracted to a neighbor, neighboring molecule's same bond. So <clears throat> that's how hydrogen bonding works. How are uh, solutions formed? So again, for example, my salt water, sodium chloride, probably the most common solution that I can think of, maybe other than the air that you're breathing, but this is a solid dissolved in a liquid. So sodium chloride solid, this big chunk right here, a crystal, is dropped into the water. Now what happens, <clears throat> as it talks about right here, sodium chloride is made up of sodium cations, and chloride anions. And when they're in a solid state, they're nice and tightly compacted like this. When you drop them into a liquid polar sol solvent like water, as it talks about right here, <clears throat> the crystals, the ions, are attracted to the polar water molecules. It's hydrated in solution by many, 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 many water molecules per every one ion. So for instance, this is what happens. So you drop in a sodium chloride chunk into water and the water molecules get so excited and a group of the water molecules say, hey, sodium cation, you're positively charged. Come off and play with us in one direction. And another group of water molecules comes and grabs a chloride ion and says, oh, yay, a negative chloride. And let's go off in another direction. And when there's distance put between the cation sodium and the anion chloride, that's what we know as hydration or dissolving as it would appear to the naked, you know, to your eye. Now, one thing to note about, <clears throat> about this, if you look at the way in which sodium positive cation is lined up with the water molecules, notice my positive, let me erase this guys here, my positive sodium is all lined up next to the oxygens on that group of water molecules right here. Well, what's going on there? Well, remember, water is a polar bond. The dipole moment rests above the oxygen. In other words, this side of the molecule where oxygen is, is very electron rich. Electrons are negatively charged. So in other words, this side of the molecule is partially negative. Sodium cation, that's a positive guy. Negatives and positives are very much attracted. So that's why they line up the way they do around sodium. And then the chloride is the exact opposite. Chloride is a negative anion. And again, if you notice here, the water molecules are flipped around and it's all the hydrogens that are lined up around the negative chloride because, again, if the oxygen is the partially negative side, a negative anion and the partially negative oxygen, they're going to repel. But in a polar molecule, one side is electron rich or partially negative, and the other side of the molecule is electron deficient or partially positive. And so where the hydrogens are, this is all a partially positive side to the molecule. Positive and negatives attract. So that's why they line up the way they do. And so this is an attraction going on between the solute, sodium chloride, and the solvent, water. Because water is polar, I get this partially negative, partially positive, and ionic solutes separate into ions. Always a cation and an anion. So you always have a positive piece and a negative piece. So regardless if we're talking about sodium chloride or copper sulfate or sodium hydroxide, ionic solutes always have a cation who's positive and an anion who's negative. And so polar solvents, and again, whether it's water or some other polar solvent, would always have a partially negative side and a partially positive side. And the molecules would line up just like this example here. Now, this very last statement here at the bottom, a nonpolar solvent, something that's a hydrocarbon like hexane, will dissolve nonpolar solutes such as oils or grease. So for example, if you've ever um, been around goop, goop, G-O-O-P, it's, um, it's a mechanics hand cleaner. 
and maybe your your dad or grandpa or you know or maybe you um if you work on cars or work around a lot of grease they sell this stuff it's like a white weird sticky stuff kind of slimy I should say not sticky and if you work around grease and oil you put this on your hands first when you're ready to clean your hands before you put water on them and that's because grease and oils that would be on your hand from let's say working on your car motor those are non-polar greases and oils Water will not dissolve them. In fact, water will repel them because water is polar and the oils and grease are nonpolar. So this goop, this product that they sell like at Walmart or at an automotive shop, that's, it's also a nonpolar substance. So you put the goop directly on your hands before you put water on them, and the goop works as a cleaning agent to pull the oils and grease off your hands. And then eventually you've got to use some water to rinse that goop off your hands. And that's what I'm talking about down here. So you've heard the term. Let me write it on here. It's so important. Oops. Whoops. Sorry, guys. Ah! My tablet's gone crazy. You've heard the term like dissolves like. Okay? That's what this is talking about here. Polar substances like other polar substances and ionic substances because they're charged or partially charged. Nonpolar substances like other nonpolar substances. Okay, so I talked about hydrogen bonding. <clears throat> hydrogen bonding occurs amongst water molecules. And you'll notice in my little diagram here, these molecules are all lined up okay, to maximize those attractive forces. Methanol, which looks like if I were to draw the Lewis structure, looks like this. Methanol is also capable of hydrogen bonding because it has this OH hanging off the end. Methanol and water will not only mix and dissolve well, but it will also hydrogen bond, which is a very strong attractive force. And methanol mixes very, very well with water for this reason. All right, water and methylene chloride. Methylene chloride, if I were to draw out the Lewis structure. You guys hear my cat talking tonight? He's going to get in on the lecture, I think. All right, here's the methylene chloride Lewis structure. <clears throat> methylene chloride is a polar solution. Okay, so the question is, let me move this over a little bit here. What I've got, I shouldn't even say it, it's really a question. <clears throat> what I've got here talks about what's in this test tube, okay? And in fact, I'm just talking about test tube A, sorry. I didn't have B and C on here. Uh, what's going on here? Water is on top, methylene chloride is on bottom, okay? Methylene chloride is on bottom. Now, <clears throat> they're fairly well separated. Yes, they're polar. If you would shake and try and mix this up, it would probably mix up relatively well. Now, <clears throat> I scratched this out, but let's go back to it. What if now, and I don't have a picture of it, but if you tried to add I2, iodine, which looks like this. Remember, two of the same thing, you have nonpolar. So the question is, <clears throat> what would happen with the iodine to water? Well, iodine and water are not going to like each other. Maybe the methylene chloride would like it. And then what about if we tried to add green nickel to chloride? Well, nickel to chloride, nickel is a 2 plus cation, and each chloride is a minus 1. This is an ionic solute. So guess what? It would dissolve and turn, change its colors. Okay, mix one. Okay, let's also talk about dissolving in terms of this thing here called electrolytes. In water, something that's a strong electrolytes produces ions. Remember, those are things with charges. And they conduct electrical current. Weak electrolytes produce just a few ions. And non-electrolytes don't produce ions even though, for instance, the sugar dissolves. Movement of charge consti constitutes an electrical charge. Okay, so what's going on here? So I've got three solutions. The first one is salt water. We know sodium chloride dissolves, dissolves well in water, making ions in water. And when you hook up these copper electrodes and try and run a current through it, you betcha, 
charge is going to move and therefore electrical current is going to flow and my light bulb glows very, very, very bright. This is a strong, this guy here, strong electrolyte. The middle here, HF, which is hydrofluoric acid, this is actually considered a weak acid and it only, just like any weak acid, only partially dissolves or dissociates into ions. I have some protons, hydrogen ions, and I have some fluoride, F minus ions. And then I have a whole bunch of intact, unseparated, undissociated HF molecules. So because I get a few ions, a few of them, I will get a dim glow to my bulb. Okay, nothing crazy. I always say it's a weak glow, so it's a weak electrolyte. The light bulb does, does light up, but it's very weakly lit because there's a, only a very few number of ions. So that's my weak electrolyte. And then last but not least, I have this guy down here, and this is sugar water. Sugar's been dissolved in water, and everybody in here should know that sugar dissolves very nicely in water. Sugar dissolves, but just because something dissolves does not, does not, does not mean it's ionic. Sugar dissolves for other reasons, but it goes back to that hydrogen bonding. But when it dissolves, it doesn't separate into ions. It still remains as an intact polar covalent molecule. So no ions means no current will flow. The light bulb does not light at all, and this is called a non-electrolyte. So again, in summary, just because something dissolves in water does not mean it's going to light up a light bulb, nor does it mean that it produces ions. And ions are what's needed for electrical current to flow and this light bulb, if connected and all that, to light up. All right, so I <clears throat> summarized kind of what we were just talking about here. Or on the last slide, aqueous solutions, we abbreviate AQ. For instance, NaCl with an AQ is an aqueous solution. Strong electrolytes completely or 100% dissociate when put into water. You get ions in solution. They very much conduct electricity. And here's a bunch of examples. These are acids, and in fact, strong acids, and ionic compounds. Weak electrolytes, as we just said, partially dissociate, okay, less than... 100% dissociation. Mainly intact molecules, but you get some ions, and that's why the light bulb lit up in the last slide. It does conduct electricity, but very poorly, and here are some examples. This is obviously water, and then weak acids and weak bases. Present in that group there. We're going to talk more of those, about those in our chapter on a little bit. And then finally, our non-electrolytes. They do not dissociate or separate into particles. You have entire intact molecules only. They do not conduct electricity. And they're mainly carbon-based compounds. So this is a solubility chart. And I'm going to give you a second. I want to see if you can figure out what this is and how you read this without me even telling you. Give you a minute, hit the pause button, look this over, and then hit play when you're ready to continue. Okay, so on my solubility chart, I have lots of different lines for all different substances. You can see what the substances are. Most of them are ionic. Some, oops, this guy right here, sugar, okay? But a solubility chart tells you the amount of solute, typically grams of solute, the amount of solute that you can get to dissolve in a particular amount of solvent and then at a given temperature, temperature being down here on the x-axis. So for instance, the question might be how much sodium chloride will dissolve in 100 grams water at 50 degrees Celsius. Now I want you to hit the pause button. I want to see if you can read this chart. And let me erase 
my scribble over here at least to help you out a little bit. See if you can read this chart and answer this question without my help. I promise it will help you in the long run if you figure this out before I give you the answer. So hit pause, see if you can read the chart. You're looking for sodium chloride, okay? Not the other stuff. And then hit play when you're ready to go. Okay, so 50 degrees Celsius. I wanna come up to the NACL line, which is this line right here. At 50 degrees Celsius, I shoot over, and honestly, it's right around 40 grams of sodium chloride that will dissolve in 100 grams of water. If I made a solution using 100 grams of water as my solvent, and I put 40 grams of sodium chloride in there, we would call this a saturated solution. No more would dissolve than that. Well, what if I had a solution with less than 40 grams? Well, less than 40 grams, that's where we hit an unsaturated. That's what we would label as an unsaturated. It contains anything less than the maximum. So anything less than 40 grams, even if it was 39 grams or 39.9 grams, anything less than the saturated limit, you have an unsaturated solution. Can you see here how temperature affects solubility? For most solids, as temperature increases, the solubility increases. So this one increases a little bit. This one increases a whole lot, a whole lot, a whole lot, a whole lot, a whole lot. Okay, one goes down a little bit, but the average pattern or trend, the solubility of most solids will increase as you increase in temperature. If we have gases, now gases are the opposite. Gases decrease as you increase temperature. My favorite example of that is if you leave pop or maybe beer out in your, your um, garage over the summer when it gets really, really hot. Most places in the country around here, I know it gets really, really hot. If the beer or the pop or any carbonated beverage is exposed to high temperatures, when you open that pop, and it has to be more than just you know a couple hours or maybe even a, a day or two, but let's say you leave a case of pop out all summer long in your garage, and then in the fall you go to open a can, and you're going to open it, and it's not going to sound right. It's going to be flat. And that's because the solubility of the gas, what happens in our carbonated beverages, carbon dioxide is dissolved in the liquid, the solubility decreases as you increase temperature. So in those hot, hot summer months, the carbon dioxide comes out of solution and is no longer dissolved. And that's when we that's what we call a flat pop or flat soda or flat beer or flat any carbonated beverage. Because it has less than the normal typical amount concentration of carbon dioxide than we're used to our taste buds tasting. Is it toxic? No, absolutely not. It's just what our taste buds usually aren't used to. All right, the solubility of a gas then, as I was just saying, <clears throat> directly related not only to temperature, but also to the pressure that's above the liquid. So for instance, at the pop or soda bottling manufacturing company, they bottle soda, whether it's in a can or a bottle, they bottle it under very, very, very high pressure. Because at, if you look at it right here, this is your, your line where your liquid is below it and the gas is above it. When you have lots and lots and lots of gas molecules above it, that would be a high pressure. I always like to see these guys are forcing their friends to stay underwater in the swimming pool. When you have a lower pressure, there's fewer molecules up above, there's going to be fewer molecules in the liquid. And these guys could easily escape out. Another analogy, think about a swimming pool full of people. So think about a swimming full pool full of people. If <clears throat> you've got a swimming pool and you have people all along all lined up the side, and you got a bunch of people in the pool too, lots and lots of people in the pool. But let's say one of these guys wants to get out, but there's no room around the edge. He's not going to be able to get out and sit anywhere, so he's just going to stay in the pool. That's what's going on here. Solubility of gas in a liquid is directly related to the pressure of that gas above the liquid. Higher the pressure, the more gas molecules that are above the, the liquid level, and the more gas that'll be dissolved in the liquid. And then the exact opposite is true too. The lower the pressure, that's this guy here, the lower the pressure above the liquid level, the fewer 
gas particles that are dissolved. And everybody's done this with a can of pop in their lives where once you open the can, you release the pressure, release the pressure. And if you let that can of pop sit out for 24 hours, 36 hours, or 48 even, again, you know it's going to taste flat after that period of time because it has sat at a lower pressure for an extended period of time and the carbon dioxide gas molecules have escaped the surface of the liquid. Now, what you might not know, not all salts are soluble in water. Typically, we say salts are all soluble. They're not. Depends on the salt. <clears throat> Solubility is a relative measure. So, for instance, soluble salts dissolve to the extent of 1 gram per every 100 gram of water or more. We saw the 40 grams, for instance, for sodium chloride at that particular temperature. We would say something is sparingly soluble, which means just a little bit would dissolve, if the number is less than one gram per 100 grams of water, but more than 0.1 grams. So somewhere between 0.1 grams and basically 0.99999 grams, we would call that sparingly soluble, so just a little bit. And then finally, we would say something is insoluble, insoluble if less than 0.1 grams of the salt dissolved in 100 grams, which is the same thing as 100 milliliters because water has a density of one gram per mil. But if you give less than 0.1, it's considered insoluble. Now, what's, what are these cool pictures over here? These are fairly insoluble salts, and I don't know what the numbers are to tell you honestly if they're sparingly soluble or insoluble. Um, they're one of the two because you have, I can see solid that is undissolved, this stuff that looks really cool floating around, okay, all this stuff. That is solid salt undissolved in water. All right, so what happens when we have a solid that won't dissolve or is insoluble in water? Well, <clears throat> we have these things called net ionic equations. And <clears throat> let me talk about the picture, and then I'm going to move this over and kind of blow up some stuff. So this is a barium study. And some of you maybe have had a barium study done in your life. Otherwise, if, again, if you're going to be in medicine, you will at some point. As a patient, you drink this barium solution. And barium goes through your intestines, goes through your digestive tract, and then they take x-rays. This one's a barium enema. Um, <clears throat> it's very toxic, just barium alone, but it's very insoluble, as well as barium sulfate. It's very insoluble. So... Now let's talk about what's going on up here. So barium sulfate is an insoluble salt and tastes terrible. I can tell you from firsthand experience. What I have up at the top up here, whoops, um, <clears throat> what's going on? I've got barium nitrate. Let me actually write it out right here. Sorry, guys, I'm out of room. Whoops. Barium nitrate is aqueous plus water. <clears throat> Oops. In fact, let's not do it plus the water. We'll talk about the water here in a second. Let me erase the water. Barium nitrate aqueous plus sodium sulfate makes, and that's aqueous, makes barium sulfate solid plus sodium nitrate. And I'm not balanced here, but that's okay. So my two reactants, barium nitrate and sodium sulfate, and they're both aqueous. They both dissolve in water. But the products, if you take a look at the products, sodium nitrate, solubility rules say that all nitrates are soluble in water. So sodium nitrate, like barium nitrate, will be soluble in water. But barium sulfate Solubility rules say it's going to be insoluble in water. And we, when we write out an equation for something that is insoluble in water, we cannot give it the AQ uh, abbreviation because it's not aqueous. Aqueous things dissolve in water. When something is insoluble in water, you label it with an S for solid. And like the picture of the test tubes on the last slide that I had with all the pretty colored salts floating around, those guys are also insoluble in water, and we will label them with an S. So notice I've got two reactants that are aqueous. Aqueous means 
separates into ions when they're put in water. And you'll have to forgive me in fact, again, let me try and clean this up a little bit here. So when barium nitrate dissolves in water, I've got the one barium two plus aqueous ion and I have two nitrate ions aqueous. And then when the sodium sulfate dissolves in water, I have two sodium aqueous ions and I have the one sulfate aqueous ion because again it dissolves in water. Those are all my reactants. And on the product side, barium sulfate does, does, does not, as I just explained, does not separate into water. It does not, it's not soluble in water. So when we write this out, this is called the, net, the um, ionic equation we're writing out right here, where I show things as ions if and only if they're soluble in water. Well, barium sulfate, sulfate with barium, not soluble in water based on solubility rules. So it's a solid, so I leave it together. I have to write it. In fact, it's extremely important, but I do not separate it into its ions because it is not separated into ions when it's in water. And then my other product, and now since this is balanced, I'm going to write it out like this. I have two sodium cations. They're aqueous. And I have two, oops, two nitrate ions. Oops. Get rid of this over here. Oh, it's not letting me erase the barium. Sorry, guys. Two nitrate ions that are also aqueous, okay? Because, again, sodium nitrate is aqueous in water. So this is considered the ionic equation. Again, ionic equation takes all reactants and products, separates those that are aqueous into their ions. If it's not aqueous, meaning if it's a pure solid, pure liquid, or gas by any chance, you don't separate it into its ion cause it's ions because it's not separating. Now, from here, we can write a net ionic equation. The net ionic equation, let me make some room down here. The net ionic equation <clears throat> shows what's really happening. So when I mix all these t things together, what is really going on chemically? Well, <clears throat> here's what's not happening. I have two NO3s on the left, I have two NO3s on the right. I have two nitrate aqueous ions on the reactant side, I have two aqueous nitrate ions on the product side. Nothing, absolutely nothing is happening to, na happening to the nitrate. Starts out as aqueous, ends up as aque aqueous, nothing's happening, I ignore it. Same thing with sodium, for the exact same reason. Same on the left and right hand side, you cancel it. What does that leave me with? Well, what is actually chemically happening in your container when you mix sodium sulfate with barium nitrate. Oops. And that is the barium ions that are aqueous and the sulfate ions that are aqueous come together to make an insoluble compound barium sulfate. So your net ionic equation shows what's really happening at the end of the day. They do not include these things called spectator ions. Spectator ions are present. They sure are. They're floating around in your beaker or in your container or in your intestines down here. But they're just spectators. They're not participating in the reaction. They're not doing anything. They're just spectators. The net ionic shows what's really happening. <clears throat> All right, now let's talk about this bottom half of the slide down here. The question is, why is barium sulfate used in this procedure? Well, based on the solubility, it's very, very, very insoluble. In fact, this is what, if you want to look at the easy way, this is the solubility. It's 0 0.00233 grams of barium sulfate will dissolve in one liter of solution. So it's very, very insoluble, which is a good thing for this type of procedure, especially because barium is toxic. But guess what? It'll light up on x-ray. Kidney stones. Check this out, guys. If you've ever seen it, this is a kidney stone. Okay, it's under a magnifying glass, but still. Kidney stones. Kidney stones are either calcium phosphate, an ionic compound, calcium oxalate, also an ionic compound, or uric acid, 
which is not, this is uric acid right there. Okay, let's talk about concentrations. When we talk about solutions, we typically talk about not only solubility and what are the solubility levels, but also concentration. Concentration, I'm sorry, this is off a little bit, is the amount of solute divided by the amount of solution. Okay, the amount of solute dissolved in a specific amount of solution. As you can see down here, eight grams of potassium chloride is used and then it says add water until the mass of the solution is 50 grams. <clears throat> so the concentration, if we were looking in, in the unit of mass mass, it would be 8 grams of solute divided by the total 50 grams. And so the concentration in units of mass mass, 0.16 grams of potassium chloride per 1 gram of solution. So again, how you would say that, 0.016 grams of potassium chloride will dissolve per one gram oops, of solution, of total solution, which is mainly going to be your water. It's like 0.84 grams of water. Okay. Some other units of concentration other than mass mass, we can do a mass mass percent, which just is the, what we just looked at times 100 to get it to a no percent. We can do mass volume. That's very common in IV bags. So if you're already working in the medical field and you work with patients where you might administer an IV bag, you probably know about this. Um, a 5% glucose solution, the IV bag says 5% glucose. That means whoever prepared the IV bag put 5 grams of glucose in a 100 ml solution. That's considered mass volume because this is mass for your solute, volume of solution. And then we can also do volume volume. If your solute and your solvent are both liquids, this is what we commonly do. And a 12% ethanol solution, typically wouldn't give this to your patient, um, but it would have 12 mils of ethanol in a 100 mil solution. So several, several different units of concentration. The most common, however, in the chemistry lab is molarity. Molarity is moles of solute per liter, that's a volume, of solution. So typically not as easy to come by as doing one of these three up here, because you've got to calculate moles. Do you remember how to do that? You need the molar mass of the substance and the mass of what you're using, and then the volume of solution in liters. So for instance, my picture down here. <clears throat> in this volumetric flask, one mole or 58.5 grams of sodium chloride was added and then we added water up till the fill line there which just happens in this particular volumetric flask to be a one liter so one mole of solute was used just just by chance that's what we decided to use and the volume was a total of one liter so the molarity molarity would be one m big capital m or you could say one mole slash L for liter, either one. Now, where did the 58.5 come from? Well, molar mass. Do you remember how to get the molar mass? It's right here. Sodium is 23 grams per mole. Chloride, the chloride ion or chlorine is 35.5, so add it up, 58.5. <clears throat> so solutions, what we've been talking about, they contain small particles like the ions, um, like sodium chloride ions or molecules like sugars. They're transparent. They don't separate even by filtration or even through a semi-permeable membrane, and they do not scatter light. So you could just pass the light right through it and go right through. Colloids, however, colloids have, have medium-sized particles. They cannot, cannot be separated by filtration, um, so like solutions. But however, they can be separated by semi-permeable membranes and they do scatter light because they're larger particles. And here are some examples of colloids. If you've ever seen fog on a foggy morning, the light scatters as it hits the fog coming through from the sun. Dust or smoke, shaving cream, whipped cream, soap suds, styrofoam, marshmallows, and you can read all my examples there. And again, notice they can be any of the three physical states. 
suspensions have even largest, in fact, the largest particles. They will settle out. So if you put them in a beaker and then let it just sit for a little while, notice the suspension, gravity brings it to the bottom. The colloids and the solutions are dispersed throughout, but a suspension, the particles are so large and typically heavy that they settle all at the bottom. They can be easily separated by filtration, Okay, this would be, for instance, like your spaghetti noodles in a pot of boiling water. The spaghetti noodles, turn, you know, once the boiling stops, they'll settle to the bottom and stop. You can easily separate them. Uh, here are some other examples. Blood platelets can be separated as well. If you've ever donated platelets, they separate them for use. Um, muddy water, you could separate the mud from the water very easily. Or a calamine lotion solution. And in fact, these things also have to be stirred to stay suspended. So let's talk about the effects that the different solutes have on the properties of solution. <clears throat> so for instance, pure water, not a solute, just pure water, no solute particles. So a, this is a pure, this is why it says pure, it's important, pure water. So it's not a solution. It's just, it's not even a solvent because you don't have a solute. It's just <clears throat> freezing point though of pure water is zero, boiling point's 100 degrees Celsius. Add one mole of some solute, like one mole of sodium chloride, you will see that the, temp the freezing point changes, the delta, the triangle means change, it changes 1.86 degrees. In fact, it lowers it, <clears throat> lowers it to negative 1.86. The boiling point increases. So freezing point lowers, boiling point increases when you add a solute to a solvent. And for water, <clears throat> again, if you use one mole of any, any, any solute that dissolves in water, assuming it, assuming it dissolves, boiling point increases from 100 to 100.52. So I'm adding these two together here. I'm subtracting these two here. That's for one mole. Well, guess what? If you use two moles or three moles or four moles, you'll see a greater and greater and greater effect on both freezing point depression, and boiling point elevation. Now let's talk about how we can get these different moles of things, especially considering over here on the left-hand column, I said you have one mole of the solute. Well, ethylene glycol is a non-electrolyte. Remember, non-electrolytes may dissolve in water, but they don't separate into more than one particle. So in other words, for every one ethylene glycol molecule you put into water, there's one mole of that molecule in the water. Sodium chloride, however, calcium chloride, and any other strong electrolyte, put them into water, and they separate into multiple parts. Sodium gives you plus one, chloride gives you minus one. So for every one sodium chloride, you actually get two, two things. So more bang for your buck, in other words. And that's where the, for every one mole of sodium chloride, <clears throat> you get two moles of solute particles, that's where that comes into play. And notice you have a double effect then. <coughs> Sorry guys. And then, let me erase some of this. For calcium chloride, and I talk about all this down here as well, but for calcium chloride, put it into water, you get the calcium ion, one of them, and two of the chloride ions. So one plus two, you get a total of three particles. One mole of calcium chloride, now you get three. It has a tripling effect. The more solute particles you have, the greater an effect. You can do this, increase this in multiple ways. You can increase your moles of total solute from concentration. Instead of one molar, use two molar, use three molar, or so on and so forth. And or Increase the number of particles you're going to have with what you put in solution. So whether you use sodium chloride or calcium chloride makes a difference because you get more particles with calcium chloride, which has a greater effect. <clears throat> so osmosis, that leads us to osmosis. Maybe you know or are familiar with osmosis. Maybe you're not. The basic definition <clears throat> of osmosis. In osmosis, water, sol your solvent, flows from the lower solute concentration into the higher solute concentration. The goal is it wants to equal everything out. So if you look at this picture down here, 
this picture here all zoomed in. Well, and you can look at the beaker too. So I've got a beaker with a division in the Somebody's put a divider in between it. And on one side of the divider is pure water. And on the other side is sugar water. It looks like I have no sugar on the left-hand side, but lots of sugar on the right-hand side. <clears throat> so the concentration of sugar is obviously much higher on this side right here. So what happens because, and only because, what I've put it here as a divider, let me erase this so you can see it, is a semi-permeable membrane, which basically has holes or passageways, as it shows down here, <clears throat> that it can come through. Another way to think about this, again, think about a pot of boiling water with spaghetti noodles, and you dump it out to get rid of the water through a colander or a strainer. The colander or strainer has holes in it, right? And the small water molecules are small enough to pass through those holes, but the big spaghetti noodles are too big and they don't pass through. Otherwise, what would be the point? Well, that's what's going on right here. <clears throat> The, solute, the sucrose, which is the solute, they're too big. They won't fit through these little holes here. And that's okay because what's happening, water is trying to pass. Oops. That's okay because what's happening is water is trying to pass through anyways to even out the concentration. Even out the concentration. And that's what, I talk, what I'm talking about right here. <clears throat> What happens, the level of the solution with the higher solute concentration, this side actually will rise because water is moving over from the left to the right-hand side. And at equilibrium, eventually when you reach it, the, two, the levels of the two solution will no longer change. They will be off, but they will no longer be changing. The amount of water flowing between the two sides will be equal at equilibrium because of the greater pressure generated by two unequal levels. The osmotic pressure, talking about osmosis here, osmotic pressure is the pressure generated by two unequal levels. <clears throat> so what my drawing doesn't show, and I don't know if I can show it very well here either, because it's really hard on a two-dimensional surface to show this, but I'll give kind of an extreme example. So here's my left-hand side pure water, and here is my water plus sucrose. Okay. And here now I think you can see the unequal levels right here. That's what this is talking about. Okay, Water would rush over to the other side because the sucrose is over there and it's trying to even it out in terms of concentration. And it's able to do that because of the semi-permeable membrane. But what of course that would do is that would increase the amount, or, amount of water on the right-hand side and that level would raise. There's a pressure that's generated from the two unequal levels and that's considered osmotic pressure. Here's another example. I'm sorry, guys, I got a tickle tonight. Talking about osmotic pressure again, you can see the unequal levels here. Semi-permeable membrane separates a 4%, a diluted solution, starch solution, from a 10%, a more concentrated solution. The starch molecules are way too big, like my spaghetti noodles. They can't pass through, but water can. So what happens? Well, water passes through, evens out the two concentrations, and I end up with a solution that still ha <coughs> has that semi-permeable membrane, but water has evened out the two concentrations. Now, instead of 4 and 10, I'm 7 and 7, but again, what's happened? Water has moved over to one side. I have unequal levels, and that results in an osmotic pressure. Red blood, why do we even talk about this? Well, red blood cells have cell membranes that are semi-permeable, and they maintain a certain osmotic pressure that cannot change without damage occurring to the cell, and obviously we don't want damage to occur. They must maintain an equal flow of water between the cell and its surrounding environment. Isotonic, this is our goal here. Isotonic <clears throat> solution exerts the same pressure, osmotic pressure, as red blood cells. And you can see what those concentrations are. 5% uh, mass volume con percent concentration glucose or 0.9% mass volume for sodium chloride. We need both. Need both in our bodies. But <clears throat> one of the two can be used in IV because each has a solute concentration equal to osmotic pressure. And that'll equalize your red blood cells. So isotonic, that's what we want for our cells. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about when the bad things happen. Here's good over here, okay? This gets my star. Hypotonic hyper 
both bad. We don't want our cells to be anything other than in an isotonic solution. But let's talk about what hypotonic means. Hypotonic solution has a lower osmotic pressure than the red blood cells. They contain fewer dissolved particles than what's happening in your blood serum. They cause water to flow in. And these things, even though if you can tell, this is bigger than the other. Okay, <clears throat> calls it causes hemolysis, or when the red blood cells swell, and eventually they can burst. Very, very bad thing. Hypertonic is the exact opposite. Has a higher osmotic pressure than <clears throat> red blood cells. That would be your you know, solution. Contains more dissolved particles than the blood serum. Causes water <clears throat> to leave your red blood cells and causes what we call crenation. And the red blood cells shrink up, shrivel up, and can eventually die. <clears throat> so what happens with patients sometimes? They go undergo dialysis. And again, maybe you already work in the medical field and you're familiar with this. Um, if not, we're going to talk about it right now. <clears throat> so dialysis, solvent and small solute particles pass through an artificial membrane. Dialysis is used on patients whose renal system is not working. When their kidneys specifically are not working, kidneys typically filter this kind of stuff out your kidneys aren't working, you go through dialysis and artificially it will separate it out. So what happens in a dialysis unit, blood is taken out of your body, pumped through a pump into this diacetate. I never say that right. <clears throat> There's a coil and all this good stuff. Basically what happens again, it filters it. Like imagine that colander with the spaghetti noodles in the water and it filters out the bad large particles that your kidneys normally would keeps the, the good stuff in, and then passes it back into your body. So see these little yellow dots here, okay? That's the stuff that normally would be taken out by your kidney, which is urea and other waste products. It takes it out artificially and sends the clean blood back into your body. There's a picture up here as well. What happens, you can do this at home even with a tea bag if you want. Sodium chloride glucose solution, and then you've got these big, particle colloid particles such as proteins and starch <clears throat> all right so one two and three i've got a semi-permeable membrane separates two compartments do 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 a and b if the levels of solutions in a or b are in equal initially select the diagram that illustrates the final levels for each of the following <clears throat> so a two percent mass volume starch compared to an 8%. So in other words, this would be the A, this would be the B. Do you remember back on my picture with the green, the starch solutions? Which one would be 2 and 8? Well, this would probably be the 2 and the 8. Which one would have 1% and 1%? Well, in other words, equal concentrations. That's number 1. And which one would solution... A on the A side, sorry, have a 5%, B would have 1%, that would be number 3, and then which one would have a 0.1 on the left and a 1 on the right? Well, you could also probably, whoops, you could also probably argue that would be number 2. <clears throat> Obviously, I don't have exact numbers with those. I'm looking for when they're equal, when the left is lower than the right, when the left is higher than the right. That's all I'm doing there. So here's some isotonic, here's a problem talking about concentration. Isotonic, 0.9% mass volume, sodium chloride solution of, I don't know what, sorry, there's a typo there, but solution exerts the same osmotic pressure as the red blood cells. What's the concentration of this solution in moles per liter? Okay, so the concentration that's given to you is 0.9% mass volume. Remember what that means, percent mass volume means mass solute per volume solution and then because it's a percentage it's also times 100 <clears throat> so that's what i've got what i don't have <clears throat> i don't have a specific amount the question just says here's your concentration and i want the concentration in a different unit Whenever you're not given a specific concentration or a specific volume, a specific amount of anything, you get to pick. Lucky you. 
Well, since I'm dealing with and gonna want moles per liter, and <clears throat> I'm dealing with mass volume, the easiest is probably to assume you've got a one liter solution. Imagine you've got a one liter bottle full of this stuff. That's probably the easiest assumption I usually make. Well, if I have a one liter solution for my molarity, there's the bottom number right there. Molarity is moles per moles of solute per liter of solution. So if I'm gonna assume one liter, there's the bottom part of my molarity. Now the problem isn't, of course, all the rest of this is dealing with calculating moles of solute. Well, a 9% mass volume also means, when you work it out, you have 0 0.009 grams of solute, which in this instance is sodium chloride, per milliliter of total solution. <clears throat> and I said we're going to assume one liter which, do you remember how many milliliters that's equal to? One liter is equal to a thousand milliliters. So, <clears throat> I would multiply that out and figure out in my one liter solution, I'm going to need or have nine grams of sodium chloride. Now, again, top of molarity, I need moles, oops, moles of solute. I'm almost there, I've got grams of solute. So from there I go grams into moles using the molar mass. The molar mass of sodium chloride is 58.5. Grams on top and bottom cancel. So that works out to be 0.154 moles of solute. And finally, again, my molarity from up here is my moles of solute, 0.154 moles per liter of solution, which I picked, it was a, I decided I'm gonna make it a one liter solution. So the molarity is 0.154, we'd say molar, or moles per liter. <clears throat> All right, let's look at this one. Nalorphine is a relative, obviously, of morphine, kind of sounds familiar. It's used to combat with the withdrawal symptoms of narcotic users. How many milliliters of a one times 10 to the minus three, so that's that, are needed to administer a dose of 3.11 milligrams of this drug. Ah, okay. So your bottle of solution <clears throat> has this concentration right here. But the doctor tells you you need to give your patient 3.11 milligrams of the stuff. Okay, so we got a couple of different things we have to do here. I need to give the patient 3.11 milligrams of the drug. And that's going to be my solute. The drug is my solute because <clears throat> it's a solution. And my molarity, 0 0.001 means 0 0.001 moles of solute per liter, per one liter of total solution. So to be able to figure out how much I'm going to use of this stuff, a volume, okay, volume, I need to be able to know how many moles I have. Molarity allows me to convert between moles of solute and volume of solution, but I have to know one of the two. I have to know moles. Whoops. <clears throat> so I can get moles, no problem. I have to convert milligrams of solute to grams. And then once I have grams, I can go grams to moles of anything using the substance's molar mass. Well, one gram, that's a one, sorry, is equal to 1,000 milligrams. And one mole of anything is equal to its molar mass. And I give you the chemical formula here. It's really, really, really big. <clears throat> I've already calculated out what its mass is, molar mass, and that's the 311. One mole of this stuff, the nalorphine, weighs 311 grams, has a mass of 311. So 3.11 divided by 1,000, divided by 311, works out to be 1 times 10 to the minus 5th moles solute. So in other words, the patient needs to get 1 times 10 to the minus 5 moles of solute. Still not a tangible quantity I can do much with, but here's where I come back to using my molarity, which allows me again to convert between moles of solute and volume of solution. And I've got the bag of IV or the bottle of solution. I can just figure out how much I have to pull out of it with a syringe. 
So if I need 1 times 10 to the minus 5 moles of solute, <clears throat> and I don't want moles of solute, so I'll put that on bottom, I'm going to convert into volume, which molarity is liters, 1 liter of this stuff, 0 0.001 moles. And I don't really want liters. The question asks you for how many milliliters. One liter, put that on bottom so it cancels, equals 1,000 milliliters. And since I'm running out of room, remember multiply if it's on the top, divide if it's on the bottom. When you do that math, you find out you need to draw up 10 milliliters of solution from your bottle and give it to the patient. All right, and that concludes our chapter on solutions.